our time is equal to zero at this point. If we looked at the full parabola, this is at 9.2424 seconds, and this is negative 0.8832 seconds. Wait, no. Okay. All right, so. Well, we, you, you talk about the, the, that line that says zero is the you know, 50. Yeah, the, this is, this is the, the 50 meters, and this is zero meters if you want. Or 40, 40 meters. But you just said when the ball had left your hand. Yeah, this is time is equal to zero. This is time is equal to zero at this point right here. The, the physical problem is this. That's the physical problem. Okay. But the math doesn't know there's a physical problem. The math only knows that here's a math problem. The math is trying to figure out, all right, at what point I have, it sees a parabola, and it's trying to figure out the values that will make the parabola equal to zero. That's what the negative is, is, is it assumes that this parabola actually goes backwards in time. That from the problem's point of view, it could just as well have been launched from this point at whatever the correct velocity is. In terms of actually solving their problem, this is the one right here that we need. Sort of put in for absolutely stunning visual visual effect. <clears throat> if it had been initially shot downwards, you'd also expect a positive and negative answer, except the magnitude of the negative would have been bigger. Because if you shot it initially downwards, it's going like this, but again, the math thinks that there's this whole other piece of it that doesn't, doesn't exist physically. Now we know the time, we can solve for this. What equation do we need in order to solve for the horizontal displacement? Exact same one. So R equals 28.68 times 9.2424. Now throw in the rest part. Plus one half times zero times 9.2424 squared. I'll save you some trouble. I'll do the second, the second term for you. There we go. So somewhere around 250-ish. Yeah, so I'm going with that. 265. Okay. 265.07. 0.07. 0.07. 265.07 mm -hmm. meters. And we can now correctly correct. And we'll do a lab at some point on projectile motion where we'll, we'll be launching it and it comes out pretty darn accurately. Absolutely. And then some point later on the semester I'll just be in the mood that we need to shoot things and so we'll do a projectile motion one. This is just a... I guess it's a random question. Would this be like, would this be the projected uh, amount of meters it would go if we were in a vacuum since they were ignoring air resistance? Yes. Okay. Air resistance would slow it down. Uh, so, let's see, air resistance would be more like that with air resistance. It's not a parabola anymore, it's yeah. parabola esque. Can you still use the quadratic equation for formula? No. No. No, because the acceleration is not constant, uh, so we can't use any of those equations. So, as it falls, the air resistance would increase because its speed by x. As the speed increases, the air resistance increases. Yeah, and so as it's falling, the speed's probably going to increase from what it was before. 
So would it, the air resistance increase as it was falling down, bringing it even further towards the wall? Uh, as compared to the vacuum. Yeah, I, the, the black line is my speculation. It would bring it in. Okay. And then you start getting into other things because there's actually, when you get into it, air resistance has three different, can be broken up into three different type factors. And so, you know, if I did a paper airplane versus a paper ball, it's possible for paper airplane to go farther. Yeah. So, we would. And it gets way complicated way fast. And depending on where you're at, versus if you're on sea level versus the rock, is would the air resistance be different? Air resistance would be different, and if you depends on how many significant figures, this number will start to change also at some point. Yeah. All right. Uh, you can, the, the, yeah, Joseph wants to say in a vacuum. Yeah, in a vacuum. Um, in, in terms of what we, in terms of the classroom, when we do our projectile motion experiment, it's not going to be traveling so fast where resistance makes a huge difference. And so, in, we can shoot a ball across the room and have pretty, within 10%, you know where it's going to hit. In terms of cannonballs, now we start getting into air resistance becomes more of a factor. And... Well, simulate on computer. A simulator, and then there's programs which actually take take air resistance into account. Uh, I, the CBCC had a computer lab for conceptual physics class where they took air resistance into account. So I know there's a website out there where you can do that. I just can't remember what the website is. I suspect it's simple enough to find. All right, let's take a break. Come back. We'll do another one of these problems. But harder. Just so you get a look at the simplest projectile motion versus the hardest projectile motion problem. Would a bullet be highly affected by air resistance just because it's traveling so fast? Right. So I, I would have thought so, but do you want to watch the clusters? Yeah. Did you see the one where they did the test on the bullet falling for speed of shots? Uh, oh, yeah. In terms of if you kill someone? No. Um, In terms of they, they did the experiment where they shot a bullet straight, mm -hmm. and they as soon as it leaves the barrel, another one falls. And they oh, want to see which one okay. hits first. Gotcha. In a vacuum, they should hit at the exact same time, assuming they, that this one indeed started to fall when this one came out of the barrel. Gotcha. Um, and I was expecting air resistance would have a much more significant fact, play a much more significant and be very noticeable difference, but they were they hit within a thousandth of a second or something like that. They were really close to each other. Oh, wow. So air resistance did not have as big an effect on the bullet as I would have thought. And that's just because it's breaking the speed of sound and it's so small? I, I, no, uh, because it was being shot with a rifle, and so the bullet was spinning, which reduced, the, I think, the overall drag. Oh, okay. Now, if they shot a musket ball, something that wasn't yeah. rifled, would that have had, I suspect that would have had, but again, I was surprised by this one. Huh. That and the elephant being scared by the mouse. Those are the two that surprise me the most. Yeah, that's a, that's a weird thing. Yeah. Still not quite sure why. Maybe the mouse used to be much larger when, when the elephant was at a different stage of evolution. Maybe the mouse is related that's, to the T-Rex. That's possible. I mean, the, um, the closest uh, cousin to the elephant is a creature that's about this big. Yeah, maybe just over time, it is still just in it genetically. It still seems strange. Yeah. Especially considering how intelligent they are, or a able to learn simple things, an elephant is. Um, but they can also be tricked pretty easily. You heard about how they, like, a, like they can be canes around like a tree trunk when the elephant's a kid, so it won't wander away. Oh. The astros are they put a stick with this like, piece of twig on it, twine on it, and they still think it'll hurt their legs if they try to get up, get away from it. It's, it's amazing that. Oh, I'm pretty sure you have. I know about it. Sure. Tuesday, I think they've talked to everyone about it. They're not, but. That's what
You're good to go. Circumference first diameter piece of the lab, and so did everybody. What were we actually testing? What did we plot? That was the second one. So for the for the part A, what did we plot? Right. So we're looking. What is the relationship between circumference and diameter? If you use the formula, you're assuming what the relationship is already. If we were testing Z, is that the actual value? All right, so let's take a look at this problem. It looks similar to what we had before, except this time you don't have the angle. And again, uh, there was one particular test where I, I did this and not thinking through how hard it would be. And then there's another test where I did this where it was like one of four parts of a problem and I didn't put it but this is probably the hardest problem on the test just so that I didn't want students to spend an hour trying to do it. This does require a little bit more knowledge of trig than what we've done so far. Not a significant amount, but all right. But we can start out correctly. Oh, I 
apologize. There's So we can move through the exact same process. What are the initial horizontal and vertical velocities? Sorry? Is, is vertical 50? No, vertical is not 50. What did we do last time to figure out horizontal and vertical? Sine and cosine of the angle uh, times the hypotenuse, which was just okay for a second. Okay. Yes. So this is 50 meters per second times the cosine mm -hmm. of theta, and this is 50 meters per second times the sine of theta. Last time we happen to know what theta is, but this is the math that we did to get it. I don't know what the final velocity is. Doesn't really matter. How would you solve for time? What did we do last time to solve for time? Use the third equation. And we'll do so again. So we're gonna have, we have two unknowns here. We have time and we have theta. So we'll need two equations. Fortunately, we have horizontal information and vertical information, and that will give us our two equations. So horizontally, using the third equation, we have 200 equals 50 cosine theta times time plus 1 half times 0 times time squared. When we're plugging into these equations, please make sure that when you plug in the horizontal stuff into one equation, the vertical stuff into another equation, don't mix and match. The number of students who just always want acceleration to be 9.8 or negative 9.8 even when it takes place on another planet, some students still are so ingrained. Acceleration is negative 9.8. One, it's an Earth value. And two, horizontally, it's zero. <coughs> At this point, when a student mixes and matches, or they put initial velocities, 50 meters per second, and then acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, that acceleration is vertical, and that 50 meters per second is at an angle. They are not put into the same equation. So I've gotten to the point where I get very little partial credit for it does that. Vertical equation, we have negative 40 equals 50 sine of theta times time minus 4.9 t squared. Went ahead and skipped the step there. One half times negative 9.8 is negative 4.9 where that comes from. I'm just going to rewrite the first equation, taking that out, out of it. So this becomes 200 is equal to 50 cosine of theta times time. <clears throat> All right, two equations, two unknowns. How do you solve it? The equal to each other? Uh, what am I setting equal to each other? Uh, we cannot make up math here. Negative 40 and 200 are not equal to each other, no, so no, we no, cannot. No. Oh. I misunderstood. I apologize. No, no. That row and that row. Yes. What do you mean to set them equal to each other? Um, to end the, so they both read? They both. No, no. This, this first one's horizontal. Second one's. This, this is the horizontal equation. This one right here is the vertical equation. Okay, now we're going to compound it. Pardon? Is he talking about doing a composite function? I'm not sure. That's what I was trying to figure out. Do you have an idea? Both equal to zero. Both equal to zero? Both equal to zero? Yeah. All right, then set them equal to each other? All right, I'm going, to, I'm going to do that if I understood you correctly. Hold on. If I set them equal to zero, so I add 40 to both sides and subtract 200 from both sides, so I'd have 50 sine theta t minus 4.9 t squared plus 40 equals 50 cosine theta times time minus 200. What is wrong with this in terms of trying to solve? 
the positive chain? No, it's it's, it's negative 200 to the positive. Uh, subtract 200 from both sides. There's two variables. And how many equations now? Yeah, one equation, two unknowns, really difficult to solve. So that, there's got to be a different approach. Joseph? Uh, if you just uh, divide by 50 cosine of theta, uh, when 200 equals 50 cosine of theta of t, you get t equals 200 divided by 50 cosine of theta, and you can then plug that in for t in the other equation. So you solve for one of the variables in one equation and plug that into the other equation. If this were not a, if I were not, well, theta is sort of mixed in with the cosine, so they're sort of, and the theta is here mixed in with the sine, they're really tied closely together. Uh, there are other, there are simpler other problems which can be solved more easily, but something like this where you've got the two variables sort of intertwined like that, you really have to solve for one and plug into the other equation. So the equation I just crossed off is true but it doesn't help us. So plugging our new value for t into the second equation, we get negative 40 equals 50 sine theta times 200 over 50 cosine theta minus 4.9 times 200 over 50 cosine theta squared. Now we have one equation, one unknown. It is not necessarily a simple thing to solve, but we do have one equation, one unknown. <coughs> All right. What now? What, what's the next step? All right, but we have, because the theta is sort of tied in with the two different co the two different trig functions, it's a lot harder to do isolation like that. Theta. Uh, I mean, ultimately, yeah, we'll, but towards what end? Parentheses. Okay, but um, all right. So let's you do uh, what's in parentheses, but there's nothing. We can't simplify that anymore. Squaring, we can square that. All right, so negative 40 equals 50 sine theta times 200 over 50 cosine theta minus 4.9 times, that would be 4000 over 2500 cosine squared theta. All right, so there's the exponent. Uh, can you cross cancel the 50 cosine theta with, uh, as you're multiplying them together so it's over one? So. Can you cross cancel those two? So it would be 200 over one and then one over one, and then that would just be 200? Uh, we can't get, we can get rid of the 50s. Okay. Well, we we can't get rid of the trig function. Okay, cool. Uh, so the multiplication piece before we actually, we could just multiply it out, uh, sort of what I hear you suggesting. Uh, it is still helpful when multiplying fractions to simplify as best you can, so that 50 and that 50 cancel out. Uh, those two zeros and those two zeros cancel out. Pardon? Why are you doing that? I'm trying to simplify it down so I don't have to do it. No, no zeros. That's, I have four, uh, 40,000 divided by 2,500. You multiply top and bottom by 0 0.01. And you get 400 over 25. That's what I did. And that is equal to uh, 16. Or we could have just done 200 divided by 50 first, gotten, and then got in uh, four, and then squared it to get 16. So we are down to negative 40 is equal to 200 sine of theta divided by cosine of theta minus 4.9 times 16 divided by cosine squared theta. Well, cosine cancel out. No, they don't. Oh, because it's squared. 
If it, if they were not squared, you still they still would not cancel out, but you could at least add the two fractions. Four point nine sixteen. Four point nine sixteen. Uh, all right, so we do that multiplication, so we end up with place one All right, so negative forty equals two hundred sine of theta over cosine of theta. Minus, all right, so 4.9 times 16, 78.4 over cosine squared theta. Now what? Yep, yes you can. Sine divided by cosine is tangent. So negative 40 is equal to 200 times tangent of theta minus 78.4 over cosine squared theta. There is one technique of solving this in which doing that actually is crucial. There's another technique where you don't want to do that, so it depends on which way you go. Now we're sort of halfway in between both techniques, depending on which way you want to go next. Can you? 78.4. Uh, what would you do with it? No, no, we can't. What would we do with that? I don't know what the angle is, so I can't tell quite that anymore. Wait, so can you do, use... right. do 78.4 78. times uh, cosine to the negative 2 theta? You could, that's not really, I don't think that's going to help us out. Okay. All right, so this gets into, this is why this is the hardest problem, is knowing what the trig identities are. Wait, where did, where did 2 meter 2 be set up for? Oh, you can't get to you. Yeah, since I don't know what the angle is, I can't, I'm thinking the tangent of some unknown, I can't simplify this anymore. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so, let's see, some room here. All right. So we talked about cosine of theta being the op uh, adjacent over the hypotenuse. The sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. If I do sine divided by cosine of theta, that's going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse divided by the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is the opposite over the adjacent, which is the tangent of Theta. And that's what Sophie had suggested. When we had sine over cosine, just use tangent instead. I'm taking you through the simpler of the method. So if you at the end of it you might go, man, no way I would have thought of that. Just recognize it's the simpler of the two techniques. The other one that one over cosine of theta and one over sine of theta and one over tangent of theta. These are other trig identities, which we usually don't use. What's one over cosine? Secant. One over sine? Cosecant. And one over tangent? Cotangent. So this problem now reduces to negative 40 equals 200 tangent of theta minus 78.4 secant squared theta. This might not look simpler, but it actually is. The other thing that you need to know from trig, and I just wish to apologize to those students I had in the past where I gave this blindly, thinking, oh, sure, it's not a problem. Because um, we don't actually care about the time. All right. What is the basic trig identity? The one that relates sine and cosine together. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. That's it. So sine squared of some angle plus cosine squared of that angle is equal to one. That is a basic trig identity. It's basically a Pythagorean theorem. If I divide everything by cosine squared theta. Over here, I have sine over cosine, so that's tangent squared, 
plus 1 is equal to secant squared of theta. Therefore, I just got an identity here for secant squared. So I have, it's like I probably need some room, so let me start over here. So negative 40 equals 200 tangent of theta minus 78.4 times tangent squared theta plus 1. The secant squared theta is equal to that. Now at this point, the more I write, the more likely I am to make a mistake. And so instead of writing out tan theta, I'm just going to do a shortcut. We'll come back, we'll make the substitution back later, but I don't feel like writing all that stuff out. So I'm going to use the letter, what have I not, what have we not used very often? Q. Q. All right, so we'll do a Q is equal to tangent of theta. So I have negative 40 is equal to 200 Q minus 78.4 Q squared minus 78.4. This is a quadratic equation. We can use the quadratic formula if we get it in the right format. This is now solvable. I know it's a quadratic equation because I have one variable here and it is squared and, and for one of the terms. So again, everything over on that side over there, random. I was 78.4 written twice. Uh, distribute. <coughs> so I get 78.4 Q squared minus 200Q plus 38.4 equals zero. The quadratic formula. You will get two answers. We cannot ignore either of the answers. Okay, what are the two values for Q? So when you add the 78.4 to negative 40, I get positive. But thanks for checking on that. Uh, minus signs have been in my existence, especially in 152. So uh, you know, I will not be shocked if I drop a minus sign somewhere in the direction. But 